There being none, I'll call Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list, and I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on the 30th of March 2021. Updated representing arrangements are outlined in the ministry list. And, uh, Mr President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today, Tuesday the 11th of May 2021, due to budget arrangements. In Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for the Public Service, the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer. Senator Payne will also be absent from question time this week, Tuesday the 11th, to Thursday, the 13th of May 2021, due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator Payne's absence today, I will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and the Minister for Defence Personnel. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. In Senator Payne's absence from Wednesday, the 12th of May, to Thursday, the 13th of May 2021. Senator Birmingham will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Defence Industry, the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the Minister for Defence Personnel. Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Women. Thank you, Senator Cash. Questions without notice, Senator Ciccone. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. I think I'll be safe where this question is going. Um, my, my, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Coalition Senator Matt Cadavan has said that the Morrison government's decision to threaten stranded Australians in India with hefty fines and jail time is wrong. And that I'd also like to quote, we have an obligation to help Australians. Does the minister agree with Senator Canavan? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Giacconi for his question. Uh, and, uh, senators in this chamber will be aware that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And as such, decisions are being made by the government, in particular to ensure that Australians are kept safe from the effects of COVID-19. Senator Giacconi, you will also be aware, as has been stated, on many of an occasion. The decisions that the Morrison government makes in relation to COVID-19 are based on health advice. On the 22nd of April 2021, you will also be aware that India was designated a high-risk country by agreement, Mr President, of the National Cabinet. You would also have seen that on the 27th of April 2021, Cabinet's National Security Committee, they did agree to pause direct passenger flights from India. Senator Coney, again, as you would be aware, this decision was reinforced by the decision made by the Minister for Health, as he is entitled to do, under subsection 4771 of the Biosecurity Act 2015. This decision, Mr President, was made Order. on the basis of health advice. Mr President, the Morrison government, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Health have been very, very clear. Our first priority as a government must be to keep Australians safe. And in doing that, we will make decisions such as the one that the Minister for Health has made. But what we have also been very, very Order. clear on is this. The government will continue to review these measures, as we have said, Order. including the resumption of flights. Order. Senator Cash. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And my first question is also reinforced by fellow Victorian Senator James Patterson, who has said criminalising Australians returning to their home country is a step too far. Does the minister agree with Senator Patterson? Order. Order. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President. And again, I think, colleagues, you will understand as members of the coalition government, 
that we are allowed to have our own opinions. Those opinions don't necessarily reflect the position of the government. Order. The government has made it very, Order. very clear. We will continue to make decisions in the Order. best interests of Australians, keeping Australians safe, and those decisions will be made on the basis of health advice. In terms of our position on India, the Prime Minister has made it very, very clear. The determination made by the Minister for Health, it will end on Friday. And from that point in time, the government intends to continue to repatriate those in India to Australia. Order. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Look, thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, my last uh, question is to the minister. And look, Senator Canavan has also stated that we should be helping Aussies in India to return and not jailing them. Let's help fix our quarantine system rather than leave our fellow Australians stranded. And that is what Senator Order. Canavan has said. Order. Even members of your own Order. government are calling for the Prime Minister to deliver safe national quarantine to bring Aussies home. Why Order, won't Senator Mr Morrison do so? Order. Before I call Senator Cash, there were interjections across the chamber. Senator McKenzie, Senator Wong, I'm going to insist on silence during questions so that I and the minister may hear them. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr President. And Senator Ciccone, you would be aware that the Morrison government's top priority is supporting Australians to return in the midst of what is a global pandemic. But at the same time, Order. Mr President, whilst ensuring the safety of the Australian community, we make no excuses. Order. Senator Cash, I've Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. We've had two questions where the minister did not respond to the quote, and you know, we've respected your ruling previously. But this is a question. Order. Well, this is Can a I... question which goes to order. safe national. I understand here, why you're a bit grumpy the this week. Point of order in silence, Senator. Wong. Um, this is a question which goes to uh, Senator Canavan's demand that the Prime Minister fix safe national quarantine. I'd ask the minister to return to that question. The minister has been speaking for 22 seconds. I, as I made the point earlier, struggled to hear all of the question myself with interjections across the chamber. Um, I'll listen to the minister carefully and I'll call the minister to continue. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And the chamber will be aware that in March 2020, National Cabinet determined that all travellers arriving in Australia will be required to undertake their mandatory 14-day isolation Order. at a designated facility. Those requirements, Mr President, as Australians are well aware, were agreed through the National Cabinet process to be implemented under state Senator Cash, Senator and Wong territory. Point of order. Senator point of point. order. Why won't Mr Morrison fix safe national quarantine? That is the question. The, Senator Wong, um, with respect, um, I appreciate you restating that part of the question because that was part of it I didn't hear earlier. I think Senator Cash, by speaking to the issue directly, there's a time to debate the merit of answers after question time. Senator Cash. Well, Senator Wong would be aware that hotel quarantine itself has actually been tremendously successful at preventing in the broader community, preventing breaches at a rate of 99.9%. Cash, time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is also to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. The Morrison government's economic plan has helped Australia lead the world in recovering from the COVID-19 recession. How is the government securing Australia's recovery and supporting economic growth and jobs creation going forward? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for the question. And Mr. President, the Australian economy has well and truly demonstrated remarkable resilience in the face of COVID-19. And on any analysis, and as will be outlined tonight by the Treasurer when he delivers his next budget, the outlook is positive. Mr. President, in particular in relation to employment in Australia, the Morrison government is committed to getting more Australians into jobs. And what we have seen in relation to employment levels is they have recovered. 
since the sharp fall associated with the initial impacts of COVID-19. And in fact, what we are seeing today, as the Treasurer hands down his budget for tonight, is more Australians are now employed today than there were prior to COVID-19. Mr President, in particular, colleagues, labour market conditions have substantially, substantially improved over the last six months. Employment increased in October of last year 176,800 persons. In November, 86,200 persons. In December, 46,300 persons. In January, 29,500 persons. In February, 88,700. And colleagues in March, the most recent Labor force figures, 70,700. What we have now seen, Mr President, is employment has now risen by 947,000. 100 persons from May 2020 to March 2021. And what we have seen in relation to the unemployment rate, it has declined to 5.6 per cent in March 2021, from a peak of 7.5 per cent, if you recall, colleagues, in July 2020, but also considerably lower than what Treasury had estimated first, which was 15 per cent. So in relation to employment, the jobs are Order. returning Senator to the Cash. labour market. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the government continue to support our economy to recover from the once-in-a-century economic shock caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government's economic plan it is working. But as the Prime Minister and the Treasurer remind Australians, we are not yet out of the pandemic. We are better placed than most other countries in the world to meet the challenges that lie ahead. And in terms of the budget that the Treasurer will set out tonight, that will set out the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to secure Australia's recovery. Mr President, what we will be focused on in our budget is further measures to create jobs, guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, but also building a more resilient and secure Australia. We have already announced, as part of the budget, a $1.7 billion investment in childcare. That is all about boosting workforce participation. In terms of women's health, $353 million invested to support women's health, and of course, $1.2 billion as part Order. of our digital Senator economy Cash. strategy. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. How has the government supported businesses to retain apprentices and help deliver more skilled workers for Australian businesses? Order, Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as you know. In terms of an economic downturn, in terms of a pandemic, the first people to be let go are apprentices and trainees. And that's why the Morrison government put in place policies to ensure that businesses who had employee uh, apprentices and trainees were able to keep them on at the beginning of the pandemic. What we have now seen as a result of our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy is 123,000 apprentices have been kept on since the beginning of COVID-19. But Mr President, we've gone further than that. We've gone further than that. And we of course put in place our boosting apprenticeship commencements wage subsidy. We wanted to actually bring on 100,000 new apprentices in a 12-month period. I'm pleased to inform the Chamber that we did that in less than five months. We have now extended that wage subsidy and to date Colleagues, over 140,000 new commencements, new apprentices and trainees have now been Order. brought on. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. I refer to reports of the tragic death of 23-year-old Liam Danher, who died waiting for a seizure mat. The NDIS repeatedly rejected Liam's request for a seizure mat over the course of an 18-month long AAT battle. His family say a $445 seizure mat would have saved his life. Why was Liam's seizure mat rejected? How many thousands of taxpayer dollars did the Morrison government spend on legal advice and lawyers to deny Liam his $445 seizure mat? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for that question. Um, that is a 
very tragic case, and I have been in contact with Liam's father, who I will be meeting uh, at his convenience. Um, I am still seeking further uh, information on his case. It is complex. Uh, the trustee is also involved, so um, in, in the process of getting further information, so in the first instance I can uh, discuss the matter with his father uh, and then provide more information, uh, as, as is appropriate to do so on individual cases. Senator, I, I think Senator, Senator, sorry, it's, I've got to check if Senator, Senator Reynolds, I think, had resumed her seat. Um, have you resumed your seat, Senator Reynolds? I'll, I'll call you to ask your supplementary. You can do that as part of that, Senator Kitching. Okay. Well, then, how much was a, could you answer the question about what you spent in legal costs? The seizure mat Liam Danher died waiting for was recommended by three different allied health professionals, a neurologist and an independent assessor, as I'm sure you're aware if you've spoken with Liam's father. Why then did the National Disability Insurance Agency still deny Liam the support he needed? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I'll have to take on notice, Senator, the legal costs, but I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can. And look, if I could, can I reiterate my condolences uh, to Mr. Danaher's family? Uh, any death of a child is always tragic. And as I've said, I've offered to meet and I've been in touch with his father, and I'm seeking some more information for him, uh, which I will meet in person to pass on to him. Um, I understand that Liam did re receive support from the NDIS from the 9th of May until the 5th, 2019 to the 5th of February 2021, but at this stage I'm unable to provide uh, any further advice. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Um, as you say, Minister, the death of any child is tragic. This was, an this was an avoidable death if he had received the support. Why did the National Disability Insurance Agency cont contact the grieving Danher family requesting urgent quotes for the very seizure mat that would have saved their son's, son Liam's life a week after his death. Has some, you've contacted the father, Mr, Mr. Danher. Um, did you apologise in that when you contacted him? If yes, when did you do that in that phone call? If not, Order. why not? Senator why haven't Kitching. you apologised? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you, and I, I did just uh, apologise. So, just to be clear, my office has contacted Mr. Mr. Absolutely, of course, I apologise. Any any death of any child is well. If you let me order. if you let Sorry, me finish, Reynolds, I'd I be happy to, to answer the question. So, I've got to, I've got to take the point of order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Kitching, on a point of I'd order. I'd like to know because it was unclear whether Senator Reynolds is apologising now to the Danher family, well, Senator, or as my Senator, question stated, that, Sen was Senator it Kitching, was it in Senator, the phone Senator call Kitching, with please, Mr. Um, the minister has been speaking for 10 seconds. Um, I can't allow you to re-ask part of the question. You can raise a point of order on direct relevance. At this point, I think the minister was being um, directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate it after question time. Senator Reynolds. Look, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said, uh, I'm not able to discuss the, the details of this case any further. The NDIA Chief Legal Counsel is currently reviewing the case and will be providing a report on that. My office has been in touch with Mr Danher, and, who is currently relocating, and I will be meeting with him at his convenience. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Trade, Senator Cash. Minister, globally, thousands are dying from COVID-19 each day because they don't have treatment or vaccines. At the same time, majority white Western countries like ours are hoarding vaccines and ordering more than they will ever need. The TRIPS waiver proposal to the World Trade Organization would temporarily lift in intellectual property restrictions so poorer countries can manufacture vital vaccines, medicines, masks, and ventilators. But since October, the Liberal National Government has ignored the pleas of more than 100 countries for our support. Australia has stonewalled and advocated against the waiver, putting profit ahead of the lives of people that look like me in countries that you don't give a damn about. Why won't the government give its unequivocal support to the TRIPS waiver? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. And uh, Senator Faruqi, whilst I understand the sentiment of your question, I am actually going to disagree with the comments uh, you've made in relation to the government. Uh, in relation to the position on the waiver, uh, I will take that on notice and seek further information from, uh, for you from the relevant minister. Uh, but what I would say is this, and in particular when it comes to, say, countries like India, uh, and certainly I've met with the Indian community in terms of um, what they've raised on the waiver, but also countries, for example, in the Pacific. What Australia is doing uh, is working with them to ensure that they do have access to the vaccinations that they need. Uh, as you would know, just in relation to India, um, that country itself has shown great leadership, not just to Australia, but globally, their generosity throughout the pandemic. In fact, they have exported over 66 million vaccines globally, as you would know. In terms of the Pacific itself, when you look at India, and you look at the number of vaccines that they themselves have also donated to countries, say, Nauru and to Fiji. And what the government's position is, as been articulated by the Prime Minister, is it is now time for the world to repay that generosity. Um, and Australia, in terms of working with India in this case, is well and truly going to play its part. Uh, as you know, we have made a commitment to India in relation to essential medical supplies uh, as part of the Australian government's initial package to assist India as it battles COVID-19. And part of that includes over 1,000 ventilators and 43 oxygen concentrators. Uh, we are doing at this point in time what we can, identifying with the Indian government Order. its Senator needs. Order. Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. The Morrison government is increasingly isolated in its morally indefensible opposition to the TRIPS waiver. Now that the US, New Zealand Order. and French Order. governments Order. Sorry, I'm going to. I need to be able to hear the question, Senator Faruqi. I'm going to ask you to start the question again because there were interjections across the chamber and I couldn't hear it, Senator Faruqi. The Morrison government is increasingly isolated in its morally indefensible opposition to the TRIPS waiver. Now that the U.S., New Zealand, and French governments have given clear support, Australia is one of the few remaining blockers to a proposal that would be hugely helpful in alleviating the global shortage of COVID-19 vaccines. Why does the Liberal National Government care more about safeguarding corporate profits than they do about saving lives? Bloody good question. Senator Cash. Well, again, Mr President, Senator Faruqi, I don't think it's going to come as any surprise to you uh, that I disagree with what you have now stated on the record. Uh, what the Prime Minister has said in terms of the TRIPS waiver is that the US announcement was tremendous news. That is what the Prime Minister has said. The Prime Minister has also made it clear that we will continue to work with the United States and others at the WTO to find solutions that boost the global rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations. But Senator Faruqi, the Prime Minister, has also made clear that Australia remains focused on working with our regional partners, and I commend the work that both Senator Payne, uh, Mr Tian and Mr Hunt are doing in that regard. Um, and vaccine developers to support equitable, widespread access Order. to COVID-19 vaccines. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. The government should be leading the support for the TRIPS yeah. waiver and broader measures to ensure everyone, everywhere, has access to treatment and vaccines. Instead, you've left people stranded, threatened them with jail should they try and come home, and still you persist in denying countries like India the chance to manufacture vaccines that could save lives. So my question is, where is your humanity? Have you no shame at all? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, Senator Faruqi, it will come as no surprise to you uh, that I fundamentally disagree 
uh, with what you have said, and in particular uh, what you have insinuated in relation to the government. Uh, Australia, as I have said, as the Prime Minister has said, <laughs> uh, as Senator Payne uh, continues to work on, we remain focused on working with our regional partners and vaccine developers to support equitable, widespread access to COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, in particular, the development of COVID-19 vaccines through voluntary mechanisms in partnership with vaccine developers, that is our best chance of delivering widespread equitable access. But as you know, we are working with our Pacific neighbours in terms of ensuring their access to vaccines. Uh, the government is working with our partners to ensure the Pacific and Timor-Leste. Senator Cash. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Could the minister please advise the Senate how the Morrison government is securing Australia's recovery by supporting home buyers and construction jobs in the housing sector, including through the Family Home Guarantee, which will allow single parents to enter or re-enter the housing market? The minister representing the Minister for Housing, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question, because this is an absolutely fantastic new initiative. It's an initiative that is included as part of a suite of measures that are in the budget, because we're all about supporting Australians. And we know that single-parent households um, have lower ownership rates than dual, um, dual owners or dual occupants, uh, and we want to make sure that we support them to jump the biggest hurdle to home ownership, and that is saving for the deposit. So the Morrison government is putting in place the, the family home guarantee so that single parents are able to secure finance with only up to 2 per cent of their deposit. And the government will act as the guarantor for the other 18 per cent. And in doing so, we want to make sure that we tell single parent Australians that we stand side by side with them in their, supporting them in their commitment and their aspirations to realise their dream of home ownership. So this will allow um, single eligible parents seeking to enter or re-enter the housing market to provide a secure home environment for themselves and for their children. Um, in 2021-22, we believe that around 125,000 uh, single uh, parent homes will be eligible to get access to the family um, home guarantee. And I would encourage every single person in the chamber, whether it be this side, that side or down the other end, to tell your constituents about the benefit that this Order. can deliver for your, your uh, um, constituents. Watt, and I'd also Sicilia. like to acknowledge um, the huge amount of work that has been done by the Minister for Economic Order. Security, Senator, uh, Senator, Senator uh, Hume, because we know that the overwhelming majority that this particular initiative is going to be able to support will be women, because we know of the 125,000 um, households that will be eligible for this, 105,000 of them will have women as the sole parent in the household. Um, we also know that 47 per cent of single parent uh, families rent from a Order. private landlord. Senator Ruskin, as time for the answer has dual. expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Uh, Senator, how will the new home guarantee continue to support Australians along with measures like Home Builder? Order. Senator Ruskin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the, uh, the measure is uh, going to help Australians, but it's going to help particularly young Australians, Senator Henderson, to invest in their future, future by extending the, ho the new home guarantee. Order. The extension will provide an additional 10,000 guarantees in the 21-22 year, allowing first homeowners to either build a new home or move into a newly built home with a deposit for as little as 5 per cent. The other 15 per cent will be underwritten by the government. The new home guarantee has proved extraordinarily popular and particularly popular in enabling young Australians to be able to get into their first home much earlier. Watt. 51 per cent of the guarantees that we've put in place today Senator have Watt. gone to people under the age of 30. So this is a hugely positive um, program and it works alongside the Home Builder program, which equally has been very successful, not only being able to provide access to home ownership, but also to stimulate the construction industry. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. 
What other programs has the government announced which will continue to support Australians to purchase their first home? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, this government is absolutely committed to supporting Australians in their dream to own their own home. And so to do so, we've made sure that we have a suite of measures because not everybody is going to want to have the same measure. As an example, Senator Henderson, um, the uh, first homeowner super saver scheme, which previously we only allowed thirty thousand dollars to be paid into it, we've increased that to fifty thousand dollars. Once again, making that deposit just that much more realisable for young Australians who want to get into their own home. But it will also make sure that we can assist them in saving that deposit more quickly. Um, the first, homeowner, um, first home super saver scheme uh, was assessed by, has been accessed by about 18,500 new home buyers since 1 July 2018. But we are absolutely committed, absolutely committed, Senator Henderson, to make sure that Australians who want to own their own home are given the easiest possible pathway to realise that, because it is the Australian dream. Order. Senator Keneally. For industrial relations, Senator Cash. Within weeks of being appointed to the new portfolios of Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations, the Minister appointed Ms. Alana Matheson, a former Liberal Party Deputy Mayor of Campbelltown, to a 26 year long, $10 million post. 26 years, $10 million post at the Fair Work Commission. Can the minister confirm that Ms. Matheson is just one of 13 former Liberal MPs and political staffers who have been appointed to the Plum federal government jobs since the start of this year? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Keneally for the question. And Senator Keneally, uh, what I can confirm is this: uh, all appointments that are made by the Morrison government. Uh, in fact, all appointments made by the coalition government since we were elected in 2013 have been based on merit. So I completely, totally and utterly reject the accusations that you Order. are making. Mr Order. President, whether it is a federal court appointment, whether it is a Fair Work Commission appointment, whether it is an AAT appointment or any other appointment, we carefully and we methodically look through candidates to ensure that the most suitable candidate is actually appointed to the role. But colleagues, you see, this is where the Labor Party want to have their cake and eat it as well. Because you see, what they are now saying is this. At Order. times we've appointed those from a different political persuasion, because our government believed, unlike clearly Labor, that they were the best people for the role. For example, let's hear the comments they have on Anna Burke, the former Labor member as Speaker, Order. appointed with the AAT colleagues in 2017. Was she not the best person for the role? Linda Kirk, former Labor senator for South Australia, AAT 2017. John Black, former Labor Senator for Queensland, AAT 2017. Order. David Cox, Order. former Labor member for Kingston, appointed to the AAT in 2019. All because we just don't appoint like you do. John Rowell, Amanda Mendes de Costa. Oh, this one, I've actually used to uh, work with this gentleman. Philip Deladakis. Gary Gray, on any analysis, Order. Gary Gray was an outstanding representative, and that is why we appointed him as the ambassador to Ireland and the Holy See. Order. Because we thought he was Order, the best Senator person Cash. for the I'm role. going to ask all I'm going to ask all senators to try to exercise some self-restraint on our first day back in their new seats. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As the Deputy Director of Workplace Relations at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Ms Matheson opposed domestic violence leave, arguing that victim survivors get enough support already. Was this position one of the reasons the Minister appointed Ms Matheson to the Commission, to help prevent the expansion of support for victims and survivors of domestic violence? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I could continue with the list of former Labor members uh, that we on this side of the chamber 
have appointed uh, to whether it be the AAT, etc., or the Fair Work Commission, or two, or as ambassador order. for Senator, I Senator Cash. Order, Senator Cash. I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Thank you. I just draw relevance. The question was specifically about Ms. Matheson's views on domestic violence and whether or not the minister supported them, and is why she appointed her. Thank you. Um, I believe the minister. I just said that she was turning to something. Um, I'll listen carefully to the answer. The minister can speak about any aspect of this appointment, in my view, and be directly relevant. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. You see, those on the other side don't understand that the employment relationship includes both employers and employees. And that is why you need to ensure that employers are represented on the Fair Work Commission as well as employees. And in relation to Alana Matheson, she is qualified for this role. She has. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, I, I possibly should have jumped when you when you gave as wide a ruling as you did in response to my colleague, where you said I think that anything related to the appointment was relevant to the supplementary. With with respect, I ask you to reconsider that. I don't believe that's consistent with the standing orders nor your previous rulings. This question relates to Ms Matheson's views on domestic violence leave, and I ask that the minister be required or respond and be directly relevant to that point. I, I take the point, Senator Wong. I could have worded what I said more carefully. However, I will say that the part, final part of the question my notes reflect is, was this position one of the reasons that referred to the appointment? I think in answering that question, the minister is allowed to talk about the specific appointment without necessarily uh, specifically outlining a particular issue. That may be debated after question time. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In terms of Ms Matheson, uh, she is well and truly appointed on merit. She has 15 years' experience in workplace relations, including recent roles as Director of Workplace Relations Advisory at KPMG Australia and Deputy Director of Workplace Relations at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She has also played a prominent role on the international stage Order, at Senator the International Cash. Labor Organisation. Senator Cash, uh, Keneally, a final supplementary question. How can Australians have faith in this minister's judgment and integrity when she refused to cooperate fully with the AFP into its investigation into criminal, possible criminal conduct by her own staff? But she prioritises appointing yet another Liberal mate for life. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I completely reject um, what Senator Keneally has said. And Senator Keneally would know that that is not what uh, is Order. certainly outlined in the evidence. But again, what I would say, Mr. President, is this: in relation to the appointments that this government makes, appointments are made on merit. Order. And as I've said. We have also appointed, over a period of time, a number of persons of a different political persuasion, in other words, from the Labor Party, because we believed they were the best person for the role. And in particular, I go back to Mr Gary Gray. He actually was an outstanding member uh, for Brand back in Western Australia. Uh, when he left the parliament, I think those from Western Australia would say we worked incredibly well. Uh, with Mr Gray in relation to representing our great state. And as a result of that, the government appointed him as the ambassador to Ireland. I confirm he was not a Order. member of Senator the Liberal Cash. Party. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Regional Communications and Local Government, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is securing Australia's recovery, which means we can deliver better health outcomes for regional Australia, like our plans for an increased bulk billing incentive for GPs? Minister representing the Minister for Regional Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator McKenzie, for her question. Mr President, we all understand Senator Mackenzie's passionate about rural and regional Australia, like those of us who live in the regions. So, Mr President, um, and Mr. Senator Mackenzie, I know you will be pleased that the coalition government is committed to improving the affordability of health care in remote areas. As part of tonight's budget, we'll be, we will be investing $65.8 million to boost bulk billing rebates from 1 January 2022 through an increase in the rural bulk billing incentive. Bulk billing doctors outside of metropolitan areas currently receive 150 per cent 
of the bulk base billing incentive payment. This will be increased based on how remote the practice is as determined by the modified Monash model of assessment. The more remote the area, the greater the incentive payment the GP will receive. Large and medium rural locations, MM3 to 4, will receive an incentive of 160 per cent. Mr. President. Rural locations, MM5, will receive an incentive of 170 per cent. Mr. President. Rural locations, MM6, will receive an incentive of 180 per cent. And very remote locations, MM7, will receive an incentive of 190 per cent. Mr. President. This means that from 1 January 2022, doctors practising in rural and remote areas will be able to receive an incentive payment of up to $12.35 per consultation. And Mr President, these changes recognise the ongoing need to provide the right incentives for the health workforce in rural and remote areas of Australia. Senator Mackenzie, a supplementary question. I do, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate how GPs in rural and remote areas face greater complexities and challenges, and what measures the government is putting in place to assist GPs and their patients? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie, for the supplementary question. Doctors in the bush face greater burden of responsibility, more complex care situations and high rates of chronic disease compared with doctors in the cities, who can rely on the support from other medical services and facilities. Mr. President. The coalition government understands that GPs face greater health complexities and challenges in rural and remote areas, which is why then more than 10,000 rural and remote GPs will be eligible for the higher bulk billing incentive. Mr. President. Bulk billing is an important component of the Medicare system and, and outside metropolitan areas, many doctors rely on the additional incentive for each consultation to help ends, make ends meet for their clinics. Mr. President, the new rural bulk billing model will encourage more doctors to consider a career in rural practice. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister advise the Senate on the government's 10-year stronger rural health strategy? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a pity that the opposition seem to be so glib about an important issue. The stronger regional health strategy Order. aims to build sustainable, high-quality health workforce access across our country, Senator according to community need, particularly, Mr. President, in rural and remote areas. The Order. new rural incentive rates are another key reform Senator that we have delivered to attract more doctors to the bush and is a key investment in the coalition's 10-year stronger rural health strategy. We know there isn't a single solution to, to solving rural doctor shortages, and that's why the government, Mr. President, continues to work on a range of practical workforce training and primary care reforms, with the aim, Mr. President, to create more sustainable community health care services in rural and remote communities. The strategy also enables a stronger role for nurses and allied health professionals in the delivery of more multidisciplinary Order, health team-based models. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My uh, question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence. My question is asked in the context uh, of the call on Saturday by the editor-in-chief of the Chinese state-controlled news outlet The Global Times for the Chinese military to develop plans for, and I quote, long-range strikes on the military facilities and key, relevant key facilities on Australian soil. Can the minister confirm that all of Australia's major cities are within the known range of China's growing DF-31, DF-31A and J-2 ballistic missile forces? Is it not the case that northern Australia is now well within the strike, missile strike range of Chinese long-range Xi'an uh, H-6 cruise missile arm bombers? How significant does the government consider these new strategic circumstances to be? Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick uh, for the question. Uh, Senator Patrick, I can provide you with the following information. 
Um, the government, as you would be aware, has recognised Australia's more complex and dynamic strategic environment through the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. The proliferation of ballistic missiles and other long-range weapons is one element of this evolution, but it is not the only change to our nation's strategic circumstances. Uh, you would be aware that the reality is that Australia has lived under the possible threat of intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile threats now for many, many decades. A key element of Australia's strategy to counter this threat is the alliance with the United States, which incorporates extended deterrence, but also uh, actually marks its 70th anniversary this year. Uh, in terms of the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, uh, you may be aware it also notes that the nature of current and future threats requires defence to develop a different set of capabilities for the future. Defence is preparing for these threats through adjustments to force structure that will ensure the Defence Force can shape Australia's strategic environment, deliver credible deterrence and respond to challenges against our interests. Defence is investing in more potent capabilities and will hold adversary forces and infrastructure at risk further from Australia, including autonomous systems, missile defence and advanced strike capabilities, including hypersonics. Senator Patrick, supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister representing advise what capabilities the Australian Defence Force has in its current inventory that, in the event of major hostilities in the Western Pacific region, protect Australian cities from missile strikes from China? Does Australia currently possess any anti-ballistic missile systems capable of intercepting long-range mi ballistic missiles such as the DF-31, the DF-31A uh, or, or the J-2? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and again, Senator Patrick, I can provide you with the following information. The Australian government is investing more than $270 billion to upgrade the capabilities of the Australian Defence Force. We are also engaging our allies and partners to ensure the peaceful development of our region. We are working in forums including the Missile Technology Control Regime and other measures to prevent the proliferation of ballistic missile technologies. Uh, but it is the case that advanced intercontinental ballistic missiles are very difficult to defend against. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Can the minister uh, representing advise uh, what are the government's uh, plans, if any, for the acquisition of anti-ballistic missile capabilities capable of defending Australia, Australia's major cities from long-range missile attack. When will any such capability be operational? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Patrick, I can advise. The Force Structure Plan 2020 outlines government's plans for investment in integrated air and missile defence systems. Funding is planned mid-decade, seeking capability by the end of the decade. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. The Minister has said she is assisting the AFP with their inquiry into the alleged rape of Ms. Higgins in her office by one of her other staff members. Given the Minister's colleague and now acting leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Cash, refused to submit to an interview by the AFP, will the Minister commit to fully cooperating with the Australian Federal Police in their investigation, including submitting herself to an interview if requested. The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, and I thank the Senator for the question, and in short, the answer is yes. I've always said in this chamber uh, that I stand ready to assist Ms Higgins and the current AFP investigation. Um, I have been careful at all times not to prejudice the investigation, and I can confirm that I am in touch uh, with the AFP investigators, and I am preparing a statement, and if asked, I will certainly uh, be, be interviewed by them. 
Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister tell the Senate why she called her former staff member, Ms. Higgins, and I quote, a lying cow? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question again. And I think that question has been asked and answered many times. And I have, and I have, I have settled with, come to some arrangement uh, with Ms Higgins, and I don't intend to say anything further. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Did the minister offer her resignation to the Prime Minister for calling Ms Higgins a lying cow and for mishandling the response to the alleged rape? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, I really have nothing further to add uh, than what I've said previously in this chamber. I, I will do nothing. I said back then I will do nothing to prejudice the AFP investigation, and in fact I'll be assisting it, and that, and that I will continue to do. Order. Uh, any Senator Reynolds, I have Senator McAllister on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. The, uh, my point of order is relevance. The minister has been asked whether or not she offered her resignation to the Prime Minister on one of two grounds, and I am seeking a straightforward answer to that question of fact. Um, I remind the minister of the question, noting that she has 41 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you about my conversations with the Prime Minister is when I became extremely unwell and ended up in hospital, uh, the Prime Minister was absolutely superb. I had a number of conversations with him. I had a number of conversations with him on a regular basis uh, about a range of issues, including my health. And the, the nature of those discussions between myself and the Prime Minister will remain between the Prime Minister and myself. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. And how is the Morrison government securing Australia's recovery with which means we can guarantee the NDIS and ensure it is fully funded now and into the future. Minister for the National Insurance Scheme, Senator National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for your question. On behalf of the 10,270 Tasmanians who now have a package on this scheme, I am incredibly proud to now be the minister with stewardship of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in what is uh, a very pivotal time in the scheme's history. Uh, today, this scheme, which has been replicated by no other country in the world, this we have, we have delivered, we have delivered the scheme. There's now 450,000 Australians with plans. And the intent of the NDIS was to shift funding to individuals directly rather and away from block Order, funding Senator to organisations. There, by giving participants with significant and permanent disability more choice and control over their own lives, which, is, which are fundamental values of those on this side of the chamber. But we are now at a point in history where we must work together. And can I just say we have to work together across the chamber, across the aisle, to ensure that we can implement a range of strategies that will ensure this scheme endures. Reasonable and necessary supports must come with some boundaries, boundaries to ensure the scheme is affordable, but most importantly, from what I have heard from participants so far, is so the scheme is transparent, respectful and fair to all participants. Despite uh, the interjections from those opposite, this government is fully funding this scheme and we are fully committed to its enduring for many generations well beyond our own lifetimes. Last week, the Prime Minister announced an additional $13.2 billion out to 2023-24, uh, which he will be announcing formally in the budget tonight. Now, this reflects an absolute unwavering commitment by this side of the chamber to this scheme. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Why is it important to secure the long-term sustainability of the NDIS? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Askew again for the question. While the NDIS has been life-changing for 450,000 Australians, 
We also need to realise a scheme that can fin financially endure, as I've said, for many generations to come. Participants entering from the states and territory schemes are today receiving 50 per cent more support on average than they were when they transferred into the scheme. And at the moment, the cost of the NDIS are increasing far more quickly than we ever anticipated. For example, the average pay payment per participant has increased by 48 per cent on average over the last three years, from 2017 to 2020, and the average plan budget has increased by 22 per cent over that same three years. For example, 450 participants receive support packages over a million dollars a year, and the numbers are far greater today than the 2011 Productivity Order. Commission. Senator Reynolds, and Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what is the government doing? To Order, Minister Senator Askew has the call. Order on my left, Senator Ayres. Minister, what is the government doing to ensure the NDIS is the best it can be for generations to come? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. Again, thank you, Senator Askew. Since becoming the Minister for the NDIS just over a month ago, I have been extensively consulting with the disability sector, with participants, with providers, uh, with those with lived experience and, of course, my state and territory counterparts, including a number of people in this chamber. And I thank you very much uh, for that support. I've made it clear I'll consult on the proposed reforms and wait for the conclusion of the independent assessment trial and discuss the way forward late July with my state and territory counterparts, who, unlike those opposite, have been incredibly, incredibly supportive and bipartisan in their approach to the future of this scheme. We have a window of opportunity now to introduce important reforms and to work collaboratively, not only together but also with the disability sector, so that we can make sure the NDIS endures. And I'll finish, if I've got time, very quickly on Julia Gillard back in 2011. Order. Senator Reynolds, time for the for answer time. Thank has you, Mr. expired. Senator Waters. Can't wait. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Resources Minister, who I believe is Minister Rustin. We are in a climate emergency, yet in this government, the government is reportedly once again pouring billions of dollars into propping up fossil fuels, including gas, threatening our country's economy, our people and nature. Why does your government remain in the pocket of the fossil fuel corporations and the mining billionaires? Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Waters for her question. Um, however, the difficulty I'm going to have in answering it is because it actually isn't correct, her, the assumptions and statements that she has just made. The Australian government remains absolutely committed to ensure that we have a system in Australia where Australians are able to access affordable and reliable energy, but at the same time making sure that we meet our obligations. And in every instance, as Australia, we have always met our international obligations when it comes to the issue of, uh, of carbon emissions. And it will make no difference, I'm sure, whatever I say in this place, um, that it will not be accepted at the other end of the chamber. But we are absolutely committed to being completely agnostic around how we deal with this issue. What we are absolutely focused on is is that we know the application of technology and not taxes is the way that we can ensure a secure future for Australia, for Australian businesses, for Australian uh, taxpayers, for Australian households, for all Australians. And I think everybody on this side of the chamber would be as committed as anybody else in Australia to make sure that we play our role in making sure that carbon emissions and the future of our planet is secure. But we are not going to do it just on a whim, the, the, the kind of uh, propositions that get put forward by the Greens. We will do it systematically based on the science that's provided to us. We will do it in a way that we can apply technology because we are the most innovative country in the world. And the fact that we are able to apply that innovation in such a way, we are the envy of the rest of the world. And we will continue to do that because we believe that the most important thing that we can do as a government is be responsible. We need to be responsible to make sure 
ensure affordable and reliable power is available because our economic recovery will not be successful unless Australian businesses and Australian consumers are able to get access to the energy that they need for the recovery. But I can absolutely assure you this government is committed to doing so within the responsibility we have for global climate emissions. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Minister, can you confirm Australia Institute figures that fossil fuel subsidies from the federal government cost Australians a staggering $9.13 billion in the current financial year, which means for every minute of every day, $17,378 of public money was given to coal, oil and gas companies and major users of fossil fuels every second of every day. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. What I can tell uh, Senator Waters is that this government is absolutely committed to investing in the technologies of the future. We're absolutely committed in making sure that we provide the appropriate frameworks so that the investment that is being made by our modern technology sector can meet the requirements of the Australian economy and Australian households, whilst at the same time we can secure uh, the future that we want for our children. So, I can absolutely commit that, uh, that both Minister Taylor as the Minister for Energy and Minister Pitt, who is the Minister for Resources, are absolutely committed to working um, on order. To, to Senator put Waters, I have Senator Rustin, I have Senator Waters on a point of order. Yes, thank you, President. Look, it is on relevance. The question went to the quantum of fossil fuel subsidies, and the answer bears no resemblance to um, that question. Yeah, um, Senator Waters, I, I, I take your point. The question I can't instruct the minister to address a specific part of the question, but the, part, the question was about um, a claim and a report with respect to claim subsidies to fossil fuels. So I, I do remind the minister of that part of the question, Senator. Rustin. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And in response to the primary component of the question that Senator Waters just uh, 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 drew my attention to, um, you know, there are any amount of numbers that you could extract from any amount of, uh, of uh, data analysis if you chose to do so. And the Greens actually do have a rather astounding, astounding track record of being able to extract the most unbelievable statistics out of uh, uh, the information that's provided to them. Order, Senator Rustin. <coughs> Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Does this ideological attachment to fossil fuels explain why Resources Minister Keith Pitt recently vetoed federal funding for a wind farm proposal in my home state of Queensland, and why he couldn't bring himself to utter the word battery and answer yes to the simple question of whether batteries can back up wind farms? Minister, can you now confirm whether batteries can back up wind farms? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, what I can say is that, uh, that Minister Pitt takes very, very seriously his responsibility and obligations as the minister um, who is responsible for the NAIF to make sure that when he gives approval for particular projects, that he is entirely satisfied that those projects can deliver the outcome that they're seeking. Minister Pitt um, has already committed to, uh, I think, even this morning, to say that he is going to provide his statement of reasons why he chose not to approve the particular project that you are referring to. And as you would also Order. know, um, is, uh, firming capacity is a subject of some dissension in the sense of you know, it's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string. But what I absolutely can commit to this chamber is that we are absolutely committed to affordable and reliable power, but we're also committed to dispatchable electricity. Absolutely committed to make sure that when we when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, we've still got power supplying households and businesses. Order. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Kitching? I rise. To, uh, I rise just a moment, to... Senator Kitching. Um, I'm not sure your mic was working. No. I'll just let senators clear the chamber. I, ri I rise to take note of the answers given by the Minister for Government Services and the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Minister Reynolds, in relation to the tragic and unnecessary death of Liam Danaher. So, firstly, Madam Deputy President, I'd like to say thank. God, we've got Minister Reynolds, because the former minister, Stuart Robert, the member for Fadden, had about as much compassion as a typical member of the Gold Coast White Shoe Brigade and should never have been in this portfolio. Let's talk about Liam Danher. 
On 5 February this year, Liam Danher, a 23-year-old man with a severe intellectual disability, autism and epilepsy, died of a seizure in his sleep while his parents were sleeping in the next room. So just stop and imagine that for a moment. Your beloved son, 23 year old, three years old, sleeping in the room next door, dies overnight. And why does he die? Because the National Disability Insurance Agency uh, has given him the runaround for 18 months at the AAT and can't buy him a seizure mat mattress, which would have um, indicated and given an alarm as to when Liam Danher was suffering a fit. Liam's, Liam's parents have said that their son's death could have been avoided if he had been provided with this seizure mat. For two years, the Cairns couple said they felt increasingly cut out over the care of their son as he moved from a state-run service onto the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Last July, with the Danhers increasingly worried their son might be having rare nighttime seizures, his neuro neurologist recommended purchase of the $445 mat, which would detect a seizure and sound an alarm. The seizure mat was recommended by three of Liam's own, retreat, own treating professionals, including a neurologist, as well as in his independent assessor, the agency itself, the agency used to try and deny his appeal at the AAT. Over the course of the 18-month appeal, the NDIA should have amended Liam's plan to include assistive technology funding so he could access the life-saving seizure mat. And that's the point, Madam Deputy President. It would have been life-saving. It would have saved his life. This was an entirely avoidable death. Instead, what did the NDIA do instead? Instead of purchasing a $445 seizure mat, what did they do? They used taxpayers' money to engage lawyers and barristers to assist in the trial, in, which went for 18 months, an 18-month process, while Liam was unable to access legal aid, and the NDIA, wait for this one, the NDIA stopped his parents from representing him. It is disgraceful. The NDIA also flew an independent assessor to the family in Cairns to assess Liam as part of the AAT process. As if the trauma of losing a child to a preventable cause was not enough, the NDIA then contacted the family support coordinator a week after Liam's death, requesting quotes for the seizure mat. So you can imagine how upset um, that family was. And Liam's mum, in her letter, which I'll seek to table, Madam Deputy President, Tracy Danher has said, and I quote, it was just so distressing to receive that email. We had been waiting every day for that mat to be delivered. So just pause for a moment and imagine that, just for a minute. How do the people at the NDIA sleep at night? I think that would be beyond most people's ken. To add insult to injury, the NDIA has still not contacted the family to offer an apology or even an acknowledgement of their son's passing, a fact which obviously Liam's parents find upsetting and cold. The minister has said in here in this chamber, Madam Deputy President, that she's apologised, but it, seem, it seems unclear as to whether she was doing that in the chamber or had apologised when she had contact with Liam's father. I do hope those responsible at the NDIA and the minister are able to accept that a grave injustice has been perpetrated here and then find them within themselves the apology to, to apologise to that grieving family in person, so not only in the chamber but to the family for the loss of that family's son due to an entirely avoidable bureaucratic nightmare. Liam is, of course, the fourth NDIS participant who has recently died due to the NDIS neglect and delay. I'm going to just run through them quickly. Tim Rubenack, who died waiting for the NDIS to provide him with a safe wheelchair. Anne-Marie Smith, who suffered septic shock, multiple organ failure, severe pressure sores, malnutrition and issues connected with her cerebral palsy. She died sitting in her own faeces. David Harris died after his mental health supports were cut off by the NDIA and was found dead in his Parramatta unit two months later by the police. So I would ask the minister, what has the NDIA and the NDIS and Thank the Quality you, and Senator Safeguards Kitchen, Commission your time done? Has expired. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of questions on the NDIS uh, by Senator Kitching. Um, 
Now, as has been said by Senator Kitching and Senator Reynolds, the death of, of anyone and the death of any child is a great tragedy and not something that we want to see, particularly if it could have been avoided. We're all touched by this, we're all affected by this, none more so, of course, than uh, his family and friends. And I think we just have to acknowledge that um, it's not something we want, it's not something we ever seek, and uh, it's something that, um, that we're all incredibly saddened by and sorry for. Um, having said that, um, talking down the NDIS um, is something that Labor does very often, very frequently and very well. They're very, very happy to go on the attack over what is fundamentally a scheme that this government should be incredibly proud of, a scheme that Australia should be incredibly proud of. There are not many countries around the world that have schemes equivalent to this. Um, it's a very, very good safety net. It provides very, very good care for a lot of Australians. Yes, it is tragic that someone on the, the NDIS passes away. It is very tragic and it's something that we want to avoid and, uh, and not see occur. But I would ask those on the other side, how many people, how many lives has this scheme saved? How many lives has it improved the quality of? Not just of the people on the scheme, but their families. How much good has it contributed to Australian society? They can't bring themselves to acknowledge that because it's not their scheme, it's our scheme. They can't bring themselves to acknowledge how well we administer this scheme. Yes, occasionally something goes wrong, as occasionally something can go wrong in anything at all. Occasionally things go wrong in medicine. Occasionally things go wrong in aviation. Occasionally things go wrong on our roads. Sometimes these are avoidable. Sometimes they may not be avoidable. But the fact is, instead of sitting over there and knocking this whole scheme for one tragedy, this is a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, but just sitting there and knocking a whole scheme that overall this government administers for the benefit of Australians and generally for the great benefit of Australians, is just counterproductive. And if you look at how much money this government does spend on this scheme, how much money would they be spending on the scheme? They would be spending unlimited amounts because they know how to spend, they don't know how to stop spending. So yes, it'd be great. Give every person on the NDIS $10 million. Fantastic. Who's gonna pay for it? Because they don't have anything that's costed. They have no idea what things actually cost to provide. Well, we on this side, we do. We actually take all Australian taxpayers, all Australians into account. And we recognise that we have to be fiscally responsible and we provide a scheme that we can actually afford. We provide a scheme that we can have a budget for. We know what it's gonna cost and we recognise this. Oh, and by the way, we have a budget. Not that anyone on the other side would know that we're actually handing down a budget tonight. Do you Order. even realise that we're handing down a budget tonight that Australians are concerned about that's going to affect Australians? Because you've not asked one question regarding the budget that we will be handing down, a good budget that we will be handing down that's going to benefit all Australians because you don't care. You don't care about Australians. You just care about yourselves. You just care about big-noting yourselves and making claims that you cannot live up to. 
because that's what Labor does. That's all Thank Labor you, is Senator capable McMahon. of. Your time has expired. I'm just going to go back to Senator Kitching, who was, I think, uh, going to seek leave to Thank table you. a Thank document. you, Madam Deputy President. Yes, I seek leave to table a letter written by Kevin and Tracy Danher to Minister Reynolds um, regarding their son, Liam. Uh, is leave granted? Um, sure. Thanks, uh, Minister. So, uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I'm really sad to say that that last contribution made no sense. That Senator McMahon has obviously not been listening to the rhetoric coming from her own government. She certainly didn't listen to the minister's response here today when the minister said it was fully funded. The scheme is fully funded. The very last thing, and it's very important that these matters be put straight, the very last thing that the Labor Party would ever do is to talk down the NDIS. The Labor Party were the ones that created the NDIS. About people with a disability, participants having reasonable and necessary supports and services. That's what the NDIS is about. That's what the ALP created. And what this government has been doing is to create a bureaucratic nightmare where those supports and services are caught up in a convoluted process where people are being either denied those services or people are, they are being delayed. Now, with the, 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 the tragic case of the death of Liam Danher, that family had to jump, jump through hoops. They had not one treating professional, not two treating professionals, but three treating professionals who all said he needed it. Now, and having said that, they sent an independent assessor. The NDIA sends an independent assessor up. And what did they say? Yes, he needs it. But unfortunately, poor, that uh, Liam passed away. The other thing, the other thing uh, Senator McMahon said was um, that we should be listening to the community. Well, you know, she should take some of her own advice. With these new independent assessments that the government's rolling out to save costs, this is what's been said about them. Robo plans, ticker box assessments, 20 disability organisations, and the minister said she's listening. 20 disability organisations have launched a petition and a campaign against independent assessments. That's what's actually happening out there. Professor Bonahady called them robo plans. We have comment after comment from participants calling the, the process dehumanising. Is that really what you want your legacy to be? Is that really what this government wants their legacy on the NDIS to be? Now, there was a bit of a um, sigh of relief when minister, the new minister was announced. Maybe a reset. Maybe she was really going to reset it. She called a pause. Let's have a look at um, the information and the consultation after the um, after the trials are completed. But there's no consultation. The trials are going ahead as they were already envisaged. No change. No change whatsoever. The, the minister, and I have to say, if the minister is uh, listening to this debate, she really needs to go back to the drawing board because what we have seen by nearly every uh, pe person and witness given evidence to the NDIS Joint Standing Committee, they have asked for the scheme, the ass independent assessment uh, trials to be scrapped and to go back to the drawing board and have a proper look at any of the issues, because we know this government has been talking down the NDIS, talking about sustainability, 
When they first came out with independent assessments, they talked about fairness. That wasn't washing with the uh, participants nor advocates or the organisations in the disability section, sector. So now they talk about sustainability. But of course we know that the forecast on the cost of the NDIS was forecast four years ago. But here they are now coming out to say that, um, it's, that somehow it's not sustainable. Well, four Thank years you, ago— Senator Brown, your time has expired. I understand that uh, the leave that Senator Kitching was seeking to table a letter has been agreed to. So thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Van. <coughs> thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the questions on the NDIS as well. And of course, the death of any individual is tragic, and, and our sympathies go to the, the family of this young man. And rather than being interjected against by those opposite, I'd rather express the sympathies of this government to that family. But feel free to interject into those sympathies your own if you'd like, Senator. So and out of respect for that family, I don't think we should trawl through that individual case here in this place, because all it seeks to do is politicise it. And if you like, I can bring up plenty of ways to, to politicise some of the comments of your ex-leader, as the um, newspapers showed on the weekend, he allegedly calling people who work for the NDIS oompa loompas. Now, what sort of disrespect is that? That is awful. If that's the way one of your leaders talks about the NDIS and its workers, you should be disgusted. We on this side are disgusted by any talk of that. It's awful. We are justifiably proud of the NDIS and the work that we put into it. That is why we. So, you, would you like to call them a name too, Senator? Uh, order. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Keneally. And I remind you, Senator Van, to make your comments to the chair. Thank you, Chair. It is why we've committed. We're justly proud of the NDIS, and that's why we've committed an additional $13.2 billion up until 23-24 for disability supports under the NDIS. Now, this is in addition to the extra $3.9 billion included in the 2021 budget and bring the total extra federal government NDIS funding up to $17.1 billion. And need I not remind those opposite that tonight the Treasurer will be handing down the budget and I'm sure he'll have more to say on that. But it's fair to say that the NDIS has grown at a rate well beyond any initial projections. In its 2011 report, the Productivity Commission estimated that the NDIS would support 411,000 Australians and they would have a gross cost of $13.6 billion. Now we know 450,000 participants are now receiving NDIS support, and it's projected that 530,000 Australians will access the scheme with costs estimated to exceed $26 billion in 2021-22. The, NDIS, the Australian government is committed to delivering on the promise of the NDIS, and that is to provide people with a permanent and significant disability with true choice and control over flexible support packages to achieve their goals. And the government is very serious about listening to the concerns raised by people with disabilities, their families and their organisations around the country that support them before making any decisions on proposed reforms and the shape of any draft legislation. It's fair to say that since becoming Minister for the NDIS, Senator Reynolds has been, providing, has been consulting extensively with the disability sector, its participants, providers and state and territory disability ministers, and will continue to do so. Those proposed reforms to the NDIS build on the Productivity Commission's original des design for the NDIS, as well as recommendations of other reviews and inquiries, particularly the 2019 Independent Review of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013, what was known as the TUNE Review. And a key aspect of the proposed reforms is the introduction of independent assessments to inform access and, plan access and planning decisions, including the setting of a personalised budget. 
all government, all governments discuss the shape of these reforms in 20, uh, April 2021 and key concerns that have been raised by the sector. This meeting, just last month, affirmed all governments have a shared vision and commitment to the promise of the NDIS. And all governments have also agreed the importance of further consultation occurring and having further conversations in July 2021 before any decisions are made. Now, the government appreciates that participants and the disability community has concerns about these proposed improvements, and it is a lot of change, but it is necessary to set up the NDIS for the future. So decisions on the reforms will be finalised following further consultation with the sector and evaluation of the current, in, uh, current independent assessment trials. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Vann. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to take note of answers given by Senator Rushton on the NDIS. As we know in the debate in this place this afternoon, Liam Danher died of a seizure for lack of a seizure mat that would have alerted his parents to the fact that he was having a seizure so that they could intervene as they had done on many instances in the past when he had had previous seizures. I want to place on record today my personal condolences to Liam's parents, Kevin and Tracy, and I want to thank you in particular for your advocacy uh, around uh, this issue. At a time of grief and anger, the fact that you've been able to turn this into some ad advocacy so that other people, I hope, do not have to suffer these injustices and traumas through the NDIS. Uh, for that, I am deeply grateful. I am also very concerned at this government's continuing use of so-called respect for privacy as a coverall for every instance where people want to take their issues up in parliament and have their parliamentarians raise them. Where Time after time, this government simply hides out of respect for privacy or respect for uh, the people concerned. The simple fact is the parents of Liam want to be able to highlight how the system has failed their son. A and we know, as we dig deeper into this issue, there might be deeper reasons as to why the government might want to gloss over these issues. It seems to me uh, when the National Disability Insurance Agency, Martin Hoffman, said to estimates, Liam's death was a complicated and terrible situation. What is that designed to mask over? We know that this young man died for want of a seizure mat that would have alerted his parents so that they could have rolled him into the correct position during a seizure so that he need not needlessly suffocate. Instead, what we also know about this indeed complicated case is that the NDIA was fighting Liam's parents uh, in regards to other elements of his care. That in the past, as parents under the previous system, they had been his carers, primary carers, and they'd been pa paid under that previous scheme to do so. Now, I would hate to think that a bureaucratic debate over uh, the, the care arrangements and who under the scheme uh, should be caring for Liam, and I would have hoped that the scheme could adequately recognise that Liam was best cared for by his parents, as, would ev as was evidently the case for want of this mat, that that wasn't the issue being complicated in amongst this request for a simple mat that had been advocated for and requested by a number of other specialists and professionals that had sought uh, uh, for Liam to have access to that mat so that his parents could be alerted during a seizure. Now we know, and one of the key failings in the current assessment scheme uh, and concerns with this uh, 
uh, bureaucratic recasting of how disability is assessed is the fact that people's needs change, their disabilities change. Liam's parents were evidently concerned that their son might have been having more seizures. Well, how are they supposed to find that out if these seizures were happen happening at night when everyone was asleep? Were they debating with the NDIA about, well, how many seizures is he having? Do we really know? Do we really think he needs this map? These are evidently very difficult issues, but they are also simple issues. We need a system that can respond to individual needs, as the NDIA is supposed to. But we don't want to get bogged down by bureaucracy and legal fees when it comes to meeting the immediate and, as evidenced in this case, urgent needs of participants in the scheme. Thank you, Senator Pratt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keely, uh, Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I, I rise to take note of the answer to the question uh, that I asked of Senator Rustin representing uh, Minister Pitt. Now, I don't know if people know, but in the current financial year, the federal government has spent $9.13 billion of taxpayer money subsidising the fossil fuel sector in things like cheap diesel for the likes of Gina Reinhart and other big mining billionaires. Now, the Australia Institute crunched those figures and they worked out that that means for every minute of every day, there's $17,378 of taxpayer money, of your money, given to those big mining companies and other fossil fuel companies to support them to make the climate crisis worse. Now, I asked the minister representing about this very issue and I did not get a single scintilla of a response. There was no acknowledgement of the sheer and undisputed quantum of subsidies that go to the fossil fuel sector. There was no acknowledgement of how deeply inappropriate and frankly dangerous it is that in a climate emergency, not only would the government be terrible in acting on climate, but would actually be actively funding uh, the industries that are making the problem worse. It's like they're in a parallel universe. There was simply no uh, acknowledgement of the reality of the situation that we're in. And I asked why the ideological attachment to fossil fuels? Why do they get so much public money when they are wrecking the planet and making all of our lives more difficult? After the summer of bushfires that we endured when the Prime Minister was in Hawaii, I'm sure no one's forgotten that. Why? Why would they get such a big budget spend of taxpayer dollars? And got no response from this government, but people might be interested to know that the fossil fuel sector is a very large donor uh, to this government, and frankly also to the other side of politics. And I've done the figures. So it's $8.2 million in donations to both sides of politics since 2012. Now, when you work that out, compared with the amount of fossil fuel subsidies that the industry gets, for every dollar that they donate, they get $10,000 of taxpayer money in return in cheap diesel, in accelerated depreciation, in a range of other infrastructure supports. What a return on investment. Nobody else gets those sort of numbers. So I must say the fossil fuel uh, industries and companies and the mining billionaires have got it sewn up very nicely with this government. And the reports are, the budget leaks are, that they'll get even more out of this budget. There's an unspecified amount of money that will go to Snowy Hydro for them to uh, produce not renewable energy but a gas-fired power plant. Um, there's half a billion for carbon capture and storage and a little bit for hydrogen. There's uh, 58 million to a so-called gas-fired recovery, with almost 40 million of that to critical gas infrastructure projects. Um, there's the continuation of that essentially cheap petrol for Gina that I mentioned before. Um, and there's all sorts of other subsidies, uh, coal-fired power subsidies, coal railway subsidies, ports. So how very convenient for these fossil fuel donors who are clearly running this government um, it, it's a plutocracy if I ever saw one, and this government just could not answer. But it's very interesting that Minister uh, Pitt couldn't answer a question either about why he vetoed a wind farm plus battery 
uh, proposal from getting federal funding through the NAIF, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, there was a very, very hilarious, if I can be so frank, interview where he refused to acknowledge that, of course, wind farms can be backed up uh, by batteries, so of course that can make them dispatchable power. And so I asked Minister Rustin, well, can she confirm that simple and undisputed reality that, yes, batteries can back up wind farms? Um, and she wouldn't say the word battery either. So, you know, the big B is, is clearly very scary for this government. They can't acknowledge that batteries are the way of the future because it, would, it uh, interferes with their uh, nonsense ideology that somehow renewables can't power our cities and homes and be a massive growth export industry for us. So let's hope that they discover uh, the utility of batteries and maybe even give some taxpayer support to that clean industry and to that actual technology that works, rather than once again propping up their fossil fuel mates, um, who happen to be political donors, who often go off and work for some of these ministers and cycle through those industry rep bodies, um, back through to work for parliamentarians, and the revolving door of lobbyists just carries on. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk.